It's a cloudy and cold day outside, and so we're back inside, but rather than stand in front of curtains, I decided to move myself to the mantelpiece. And I'm hoping that this will be a lovely setting for what I think will be a long and rainy and perhaps cold winter. So, as we come to the end of the liturgical year, and we stand at the beginning of Advent, which starts next Sunday, let us hear the readings for the last Sunday in Pentecost. A reading from the 25th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Here ends the reading. It is said that the very first bit of faith statement in the early church was the claim that Jesus is Lord. Over years, our faith statements have evolved into the Apostles' Creed, into the Athanasian Creed, into the Nicene Creed. But the earliest creed, the simplest statement of what Christians believed, was that Jesus was Lord. And, and the word Lord, of course, is more complicated than we think of it today as your lordship or, or some sort of archaic form of address. It, it means Jesus is king, or more to the point, Jesus is emperor, and Jesus is the one who reigns, not a human being. One of the commentators I was looking at pointed out that this is the only passage that we know of in the gospel accounts where Jesus describes himself as king. It's the only time he identifies himself as king. And, and it's interesting that the context is post-resurrection and after the end of the world has come and the final judgment is being carried out. At that point, Jesus takes his seat on his throne. He is revealed finally as king of king and lord of lords, which was, again, by the way, a title that was given to earthly rulers, to the king of uh, the Hittites, or to king of the Babylonian, or the king of the Persians, or the Roman emperor, or the pharaoh. They would describe themselves as king of kings and lord of lords. But we say that about Jesus, 
and not about any human being. And, and, and that's a really important thing because when we say Jesus is Lord, what we are saying is that the king, the emperor, the president, the dear leader, the prime minister, whatever, they are not the king, that Jesus is the king. And, and, and you know, don't think about Jesus only in the sense of his post-resurrection uh, appearances or, or his, the, the, when he is revealed in his power and his glory. Remember that Jesus came and walked among us poor, without possessions, without a home, without a place to lay his head, persecuted and rejected. That persecuted and rejected one, the one that was crucified by the mob in collusion with the government, it's that one that is the king. It's that one that is Lord of Lords. It's that one who sits on the eternal throne and judges the world as the world gathers before him. Just that idea that it is the rejected one who is actually the king, at least in God's economy, is a reminder that what happens in our everyday life and what we see people being blessed with or rewarded with, that's not necessarily what God is thinking. That to see someone who has billions of dollars or great power or great fame or, or followers or, or people who hang on his or her every word or, or artistic endeavor, that doesn't mean that God has blessed them. It just means that they have that stuff now. That there will be a judgment. And the one who judges is not a peer who has that same kind of power and authority who was swimming in wealth during his life, but it is the one who begged, who had to depend on the people around him for the food that he ate, on the one who went quietly to his execution, on the one who God blessed and raised from the dead. We tend to create these personality cults around people who are wealthy or powerful, somehow thinking that maybe their charisma or the, the, their leadership aura will rub off on us if we can get close enough to them. And, and some of that's just instinctive. We are ultimately animals at one level, and, and, and we're very aware of our uh, where we are in, in succession with one another, we're very much aware of our status within the community. And if we can somehow connect ourselves with someone of high status, maybe we will be given status too because of that reflection. But again, that's not what Jesus thinks. What Jesus is asking us to do is connect to him, a man who had no status and was rejected. And it is by that connection that ultimately, in the end, we can hope that we will have status. Now, this idea of, of somehow privileging the wealthy in the eyes of the community or even in the eyes of the church is, is, is not something that's new. Jesus' brother James, in his epistle, writes to people critiquing the church and say, look, folks, when, when a rich man comes into the church, what do you do? You get up, you give him a seat, you give him the finest place at the table, and when a poor man comes in, you say, just sit here at my feet. And, and, and maybe you give the poor man the leftovers from the meal. You treat the rich one way and the poor another. And that's within a decade or so of Jesus' death and resurrection. People were already struggling with this. So don't think that somehow we've lost the thread. This has been a constant problem in the church and a constant worry in the church. And it's something that we keep in front of us when we keep the cross and Jesus in front of us, because it reminds us that what we think we are seeing is not what God is seeing. You know, I, 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 you see it presently in church. I remember this one time at general convention. I was a deputy on the floor. It was during the debate about whether or not general convention would consent to the election of Gene Robinson as the Bishop of New Hampshire and the first openly gay uh, man to be elected bishop. And 
somebody got up at one of the microphones to make a point during the debate and, and said, look, folks, the issue here is that we don't have all the voices that need to be in the room sharing their thoughts because the wealthy are not here and the wealthy are opposed to this action. And then he sat down and I remember thinking, did he think that was going to make the point that the church shouldn't do this? The fact that the wealthy would oppose it? And I guess by implication, we might find that our, uh, our, our donations or the income to the church might decline. This idea that if someone is going to withhold money from the church because they're unhappy with the church, that somehow the church needs to respond to let the people with money control the fate of the church. Duh, it's a very dangerous thing, and I, I can't tell you how many times I have heard that kind of logic shared in one way or another around a vestry table, during a church meeting, a diocesan meeting, not so much here in Rhode Island lately, but throughout my time in the church, nearly 30 years now of ordained ministry, I've heard that idea one way or another, and, and it's scandalous, and it speaks to what James was saying to the early church, and it speaks in exact opposition to what we hear in this account that Jesus gives of what the judgment will be like. Now, it's not to say that wealthy people are automatically evil or wealthy people are automatically disliked by God because that's not true either. You can look in the biblical accounts, you can hear stories of Job, who was considered a fabulously wealthy person. Joseph, who became like a son to Pharaoh and had control of all of the riches and wealth of Egypt, the superpower of that time. Of Abraham, who had numerous flocks and had people that were in his household, was considered a powerful chief in his own right. Solomon, who had incredible wealth and was renowned for his wisdom. And, and occasionally he fell, but he still managed to live a life that was close to God, and God blessed him because of that. Or even King Josiah, who is one of the later kings of Israel, and returned Israel to the worship of God, and in doing that, God blessed Josiah. But these were all rewarded because of their faithfulness and their wisdom and their ability to judge with fairness. They weren't blessed because they were wealthy. They were blessed because they were faithful. And some of that blessing became wealth for them. But wealth is probably a two-edged sword as far as a blessing goes because with it comes great responsibility and the ability to do great harm if wasn't, one isn't careful. And, and just remember even the story of Job. So Job was tested mightily by God, even as Job was the wealthiest man of the world at the time. His friends who watched Job suffering thought they understood why, because Job had done something that had offended God and God was punishing Job. And, and you know, if you read the book of Job, you know that's not the case at all, that Job was caught up in something cosmic that was not of his doing. In the end, when God appears to Job and, and begins to set things back to right, God says to the friends who were trying to say to Job that clearly you were poor and you had your possessions taken from you because you had done something wrong and God was punishing you, that that wasn't the case at all. And God insisted that Job's friends had to apologize to Job because they had spoken poorly of Job and they had spoken poorly of God. Interesting though, if you look, that list of, of names of, of wealthy and powerful people who were given their wealth and everything because they were faithful to God, you don't hear names like that in the New Testament or accounts like that in the New Testament. It's as if when Jesus comes, the poor and the outcast, the crucified one, the whole way of understanding the world sort of shifts and it's tilted. And again, to say Jesus is Lord is to make a very powerful theological statement and to also make a rejection of the way things are in the world today. One of the authors I was reading this week writes, it would, be a, it would be difficult to find a stronger affirmation that righteous behavior is not the product of a moral calculus designed to attract divine attention. In other words, you do the right thing so that God will see you and reward you. But rather, 
righteous behavior is an organic outgrowth of one's allegiance to the ways of the king. That if you do what Jesus asks you, you naturally care for the poor. If you are transformed by the Spirit more fully into the image of God, you naturally care for the sick. You naturally have compassion and empathy for those who are suffering and struggling. And you find a growing distance between you and those whose wealth and power and prestige has made them arrogant and dismissive of others. Again, as, as, as one of uh, the writers says of this passage this week, and I think it's the thing that I want to hold in front of me all through this coming week, the notion of divine judgment, the idea that there is a final judgment that we will all have to stand at the foot of the throne of God, at the foot of the throne of Jesus the King, this notion of divine judgment safeguards against viewing historical winners as the ultimate winners. It's a reminder of how God views history and how differently God's view of history is than our view. As we live into a time of Thanksgiving week where we are separate from one another, maybe we shouldn't see this as punishment, but as an opportunity to conform ourselves more closely to Jesus and understand by this act of service and love, separating from our loved ones in this time. We are naturally showing that we are following in the ways of our King and rejecting the ways of the world. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of the one, holy and undivided Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day, this week, and always. Amen.